Pipes. I love when you're in a bar and you're having this conversation and everybody around you gets all riled up because everybody seems to have huge passion around the validity of their code. Everybody wants to make sure that everything is correct as possible and everybody seems to have the best way to do that, right? Everybody knows the best way to do that. Um, how many people in the room are hardcore testers? I love TDD. Everything I build has tests. Every line of code is tested. Got a couple, cool, awesome. And how many of you are, I'm going to make everything in code in the type system so I don't have to ever write a test, why would I need that? Patrick, no surprise. <laughs> After the last talk, no surprise. Um, so, so there are a couple of people. Um, I believe that one of the reasons that people get so riled up isn't just because they're so passionate about making sure that their code is correct, I think of it is also because of something called intersubjectivity. The idea that we create a language that helps us to form our group, our community, and we have the ability to speak with each other, communicate with each other based on terms like parametricity or monad. Um, these, these terms that if you're not a member of the group, if you're not a member of the community, they're not really easy to learn. It's not really easy to go and just Google what is that concept and come out with an answer. Um, it actually requires quite a lot of work and understanding in order to become a part of the community because we've created this language. And I think that this is it's, it's a terrible thing for our community. It distracts from what we're really trying to do with moving uh, software engineering forward. So I'm going to attempt in this talk to not use terms that I think people won't understand immediately. I feel pretty safe here because we're at a Scala conference. So. I feel like there's probably less people that are, are, are going to be coming at me in a bar ready to, ready to fight. So to get started, we'll, we'll just kick off with some quotes. Some really influential, important people that have influenced my career have, have said things about types and, and about tests. So first thing first is Martin Fowler. Everybody knows who Martin Fowler is, right? He's written some of the most influential books in the industry um, in, in recent history. Uh, so he says, when in doubt, create a type. He works for ThoughtWorks, which is a company that sells TDD, right? Like their consultancy and their main goal is to make everybody doing TDD. TDD as in test-driven development, not type-driven development. So a guy named Yaron Minsky, who loves OCaml, he says his goal is to make illegal states unrepresentable. And I, I love this phrase. I think this is a, a, an excellent goal. A guy called Ron Jeffries, one of the people who signed the Agile Manifesto, recently tweeted that he wanted to learn a functional language, and he asked, what should I learn if I'm trying to learn functional? And I said, well, do you, know, do you care about type systems? Are you comfortable with them? Because it's going to change the recommendation. And he says, quote, I don't check types. I write code that puts things in the right places. <laughs> so he is definitely on the, on the testing side. But this just happened a couple of weeks ago, so it's, it's very recent that people are, are saying things like that. Um, Stu Holloway, he runs a company called Cognitech, used to be called Rel Relevance. It's the company that supports Rich Hickey and his work with Clojure. Um, he says probably seven or eight years ago at this point, he says in five years we'll view compilation as the weakest form of unit testing. I've not followed up to see if he still believes that. And a guy called Jay Fields who works for a company called DRW, um, doing trading. He says, given a good enough test suite, the return on investment simply doesn't justify static typing. So I really love that he's, he's kind of given this some context and he says, listen, I, I put code into production for, it goes into production for five minutes and then I take it out. It's got to be an ex fast enough to make the trades that I need and the return on investment to make sure that the, the types align isn't there for me. Who knows this guy? DHH. He invented something called Rails. Um, really important guy who says TDD isn't useful anymore. It kind of, it, it, we're done with it. We shouldn't be doing it anymore. It actually hurts the design of our code. So that scares me a little bit because he doesn't, have a type system worth using and he's not writing tests to drive his code. So that's a little bit scary for me. Um, so, you know, I also haven't followed up with him to say, you know, what are you doing to make sure your code is valid? So 
I think that a huge turnoff in our industry, especially with type systems, is the idea that if you are if you love types, if you're passionate about types, you tend to get, get this theory that everything has to be Haskell. If you're not Haskelling everything, you are failing at life. And if you ever use Perform Unsafe I/O, you are the worst thing ever. You should never do that. Um, you hear Haskell guys say it all the time. Okay, so what am I talking about when I'm talking about types? You guys just saw Patrick's talk, and so you have a really good idea some of the things that you can do encoding things into your type system. So when I talk about types, I'm talking about abstractions, but I'm not talking about the types of abstractions that make things more general. I'm talking about the type of abstractions that make things more specific. Um, reducing the domain that, that you're allowed to work with when you're, when you're writing your functions. Who's read this book? Nobody at a Scala conference? <laughs> so this is lectures of Curry-Howard isomorphism. Um, 273 pages of logic. Uh, this is essentially associating code to formal logic. Um, I don't recommend you read it. <laughs> Unless you're a real math person and you, you love this type of reading material, uh, most people are not going to find it enthralling, right? It's not going to keep you turning your pages. Um, what's the problem with associating code with logic? We're really, 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 really bad at logic. Day-to-day -day life, we have lots of different interactions with humans that are not very good at logic, right? Like our clients, I'm a consultant, probably a lot of you are consultants, your clients are not great at logic, right? The people that you're writing code for tend to give you requirements that conflict with other requirements. Have it, all, it happens all the time. So Curry-Howard isomorphism essentially states that a type signature is a theorem and the function definition is the proof. When I started to think about my code this way, it completely changed everything I do. My code has completely changed now that I think of it this way. When I'm thinking about proofs, Generally, before I, before I learned this, I thought, oh, mathematical proofs are so boring, I don't want to do that. that, that wasn't my, th those weren't my most fun days in university. That wasn't what I enjoyed doing. Um, but then I realized, oh my gosh, I'm, I can just write out a function, making sure it complies to a type signature, and that's essentially, if I've used types correctly, that's proof, which is pretty cool. OK, so what do types do for us? The number one thing that most people think about when they think about type systems is, OK, they reduce bugs. Um, that's the goal, right? Making sure that we are aligning things correctly and we're not uh, creating bugs in our code. Type systems can make code run faster. The type annotations, if, if used correctly, can be used within the compiler to make your code run faster when it's deployed. Dirty little secret mostly not happening. That, that doesn't actually exist. It could happen. It's theoretical. Most We're not really doing it. What they do do is define interfaces. Um, defining interfaces for how our portions of our code will interact with other portions. And if we have a good static ty type checker, it checks the compliance to ensure that we have the, what we said we wanted is exactly what we got. But I think probably the most important thing that a type system does for us is it documents our model. Documenting the model, I think a lot of people would say, when you build a model in your head, it's, it's awesome to be able to write that down in a way that you can check to make sure that it's correct. So models are awesome. Building the model is always great. It helps you to create a language with your client. But the problem with models, what most of you are probably thinking right now is, OK, great, I build these models, and then my client decides that you know, what they wrote on the board isn't really what they want. It's nothing like what they want. It's what they wanted day one, but, but models tend to change and grow and, and get more complex as you start to add in little bits of reality. So you have to be able to throw away your model. If you can't throw away your model, you're wasting your time. So that's one of the problems that a lot of people will, will talk about when they're talking about not wanting to use uh, languages that, that are static typing, ch static Checking, statically checking the types. OK, so the other side of the coin, right, is testing. Um, people who test tend to want to test 100%. It's really important. And they say things like, I don't get the types of errors that a type system could prevent in my code. That's not the types of errors I'm getting. 
So obviously there, you know, there are different levels of type systems. We, in, in the previous talk today and in, in other talks that are coming, we'll find out that actually people who say this probably just don't know a lot about what the type system can do for you. Or they're using languages that don't have great type systems that cannot do things like refinement types and dependent types. So what do tests do for us? Well, they do a lot of the same things that types do, right? Their, their goals are the same. They can't make code run faster, but I already said we're not generally doing that anyway. And they don't really define interfaces. They can't tell you that you're using your code correctly. They can only tell you that the, the, the test that you thought of to write didn't work, you fixed the code, and then it did work. So, okay, so I'm saying a couple of negative things about tests. I used to work for ThoughtWorks. I used to tell everybody, you have to write tests. It's, it's the law, you have to write tests. Um, so why would I say you should be writing tests? Because I think writing tests gives you the ability to test that logic that isn't really mathematically correct. It gives you the ability to, to test things that you expect could go wrong. And we saw in the, the puzzler's talk yesterday that there are a lot of things that you're not really sure exactly how they're working until you've written the test to prove it. The more complex the type system becomes, the more tests you probably need to write. So what kinds of tests? Functional tests, like the, the big overall tests that just make sure your system's doing generally what your client has asked for are really important. I think those are needed regardless of the language that you're using. Who here's used property-based testing? Cool. Um, so property-based testing essentially allows you to describe some aspect of your system and then it will, it will test that all the properties that you've said are true are actually true. So this is kind of getting you one step closer to having a type system. Unit tests, this is the stuff that you're writing to drive your design, your TDD. Um, REPL tests. A few years back, there was this huge meme that you don't really have to write tests anymore because we've got a REPL. All the cool languages have REPLs, so you really you figure out the design of your algorithm in a REPL, and then you put it in your file. You're fine. You've tested it in a REPL. Obviously, there's a problem there because you don't have the suite of tests to, to run regression, uh, your regression tests. And also, I was uh, my husband's just learning to code, and one night he, he was hacking out some code on the couch and I'm working on something in the other room and he says, hey Amanda, you know what really sucks is when you have to change your test, you absolutely know your code's correct, but you, your test turns out to be wrong. I was like, well, how do you know your code's correct if your test is failing? Well, it's just code, I just wrote the wrong code. So, okay, so you're writing code to test your code and you don't know that your test code is right, so you don't know that your real code is right. So it's kind of a chicken and egg problem. If you can't test your tests, how do you know, how do you know that you're correct? So all this kind of got me thinking. I was working for a company called ThoughtWorks and I was in love with functional programming. I was, at the time I was working uh, very heavily in F-sharp and I was saying, okay, I've got types and I've got this test, so what am I supposed to be doing? What's right, what's wrong? I don't really know what I'm expected to do here. I'm telling people day to day that they have to do TDD, but in my own world, I'm like, that's not really how I operate. So I felt kind of like a fraud. So I started asking the question, you know, what are, what are other people doing? And I was really lucky because I got to go to conferences like these and I was talking to a bunch of speakers because I was talking about F Sharp quite a lot. And so when I had these conversations with really smart people, I'd say, well, what are you doing? And lots of people were like, I don't know. I'm, I'm asking myself the same question. I've been thinking it for a while and I have, I've not really said it out loud because I didn't really have an answer. And it's better to ask a question when you already have an answer. So I'm like, okay, cool. I was dumb enough to ask questions because, and not have an answer just because I didn't know. And I, I felt like I was the person who was, you know, kind of out there, like, I'm just really dumb, I don't get it, what am I supposed to be doing? But then all these really smart, influential people said, I don't get it either, let's figure it out, let's work together and see if there is a right or wrong answer. So we decided we wanted to be as lazy as possible and make the right thing to do the easy thing to do. <clears throat> I was working with people like Dean Wampler, Michael Feathers, um, and Paul Snively. And Paul actually had some time to work with me on this. A lot of the others, we would meet in Chicago, we, we all got together in the ThoughtWorks office and in, in the DRW office as well, and said, okay, well, um, how could we go about figuring out what's best? So we decided, okay, let's, let's make this scientific. 
And so we said, well, we're all engineers here. Let's, let's propose an experiment and figure out what the best thing to do. Is it types or is it tests? And so Paul and I got together to, um, to figure out what, how would we go about that. And we looked at something called a code kata. A code kata is essentially it's a problem that's uh, you can solve it in many different ways, in any different language or framework, et cetera, et cetera. It just gives you the ability to practice your, your programming and hone your craft. So if you don't know what a code kata is, you should definitely Google that, look them up, and start writing some code katas yourself. It'll make you a better programmer. Um, well, when Paul and I started talking about which kata we would want to do, we wanted to have something that was representative of a real world situation so that we weren't just making this, you know, oh, this is just some, some little thing and nobody's going to listen to the outcome. Um, so we decided we wanted to do the bank OCR code kata. Um, essentially, you've got these, these OCR characters, digits, that are supposed to form a bank account number. So if you if we draw some lines in there, you can kind of see how this you know, builds up, this big string builds up to be an account number. So our job is to accept all these strings and transform them into the, the digits, into the account numbers. And the second part of this is that there is actually a checksum to make sure that it is a legitimate account number and not just you know, somebody's hacked in some numbers. There are more stories in this kata, but these are the ones that I'm going to focus on in this talk. We did actually complete all of them. Um, this checksum is a really straightforward, simple checksum where you're just multiplying some, some numbers and adding them together. It's just a, a, a very simple algorithm. So what did we decide to do? We wanted to try every approach that we had been working with ourselves or been hearing about in the industry. We said, OK, TDD is the obvious one. We've got to try test driving the code. And then we said, well, most people, when they say they're doing TDD, in my experience, in the clients that I had been working with, they weren't really doing TDD. They were just te writing tests throughout writing their code. Right? They already had a design in their head. They, they wrote the code, and then they wrote the test after or throughout their, their coding experience. Functional tests. At the time, there are a lot of people who say, OK, just as long as you got the functional test working, you don't really have to deal with this this craziness of writing tests at every line. You don't have to do that. So I said, OK, cool, we'll just write the functional test. And luckily enough, the functional tests are actually written in the code kata, so we have the tests to start with. Um, and then there's something called type signatures first, which is kind of like type-driven design. If you're reading the Idris book, uh, if you align your types first, if you write out the type signature and then you kind of just stub in the functions to return the, the types that you need, then you could build your design that way. And Michael Feathers and I had been working in that way um, for quite a while, and he actually did a talk on it at Strange Loop a couple of years back. The REPL-driven development that we had talked about, this had become all the rage. And I think there are still a lot of people who think that just writing REPL tests is kind of enough. You've proven that the code works. You write it, you commit it, you're good. But we wanted to see, does this actually lead to good design? Does it lead to readable code? So then property-based testing. Um, property-based testing is awesome, right? But has anybody ever done their property-based testing first? Yeah, there's somebody in the room. OK, cool. I had never heard of that. I thought, that's crazy. I, I don't even know how to think like that. So we reached out to John Hughes and said, hey, could you help me figure out how to think uh, test test driving my code with property tests first. And he says, yeah, that's how I do it. That's how you're supposed to do it. Do you mean people aren't doing it that way? Which I thought was really funny, because everybody that I've talked to since has said, no, I don't do it that way. <laughs> um, so anyway, we tried all these different techniques and, and tried to figure out what's going to give us the cleanest code, what's going to give us the most um, maintainable, updatable, um, fast performing. We looked at a bunch of different aspects of the, of the situation. And now I have a slide that says analysis instead of outcome. And that's because most of these things are very subjective. We're not, we're not able to, to come back and say, this is the right way. This is the only thing you should be doing. Um, but I will tell you some of the things that I learned while I did do it. We looked at thousands, literally thousands, of, of code samples of people who had done this, uh, this code kata. Uh, Paul and I did it in a number of different ways. We tried a, a ton of different techniques ourselves and in a bunch of different languages ourselves. Um, but then also we realized, well, we're two people, and lots of people have already done this code kata. It's online. And 
there's such a thing called GitHub where people check their code into that I can actually go steal their code, which was quite cool because people were part of my experiment and they didn't even know it. Um, literally tried every language we could think of. Um, and since then, new languages have been created and people have come to me and said, hey, do you mind if I contribute? I'd love to do this with you to you know, see how my, my language compares, which is pretty cool. Um, OK, so get into some of the analysis. What is this code doing? Yep, I don't know either. It's horrible. That's horrible code. It's actually just it's translating a string into a digit. It's actually doing something really simple. It's just using some pattern matching to do it. But it's really ugly. And, and I don't actually like Amanda six months ago who wrote that code. I don't want to read that. I, I need other, um, other things have to exist within my language in order for me to be able to write maintainable, clean code. I realize, OK, it's not just types or tests. There are other really important aspects of the language. So here's an example, um, just some code in F sharp. And you can see that now we've got the multi-line strings. So it, the pattern matching, although in this slide, it, it's really messed up. So I'm not sure what happened there. But that's just a, that's a slide error, not a real error. Multi-line strings make this really easy to read. Um, but you can see that I, I put in some types for the different uh, numbers. Um, I use some pattern matching to just translate those numbers. And then. I wrote a checksum using even more types. Um, so here we've got an account type. It could be valid. It can be invalid. Um, and then we've got a, a function for the checksum. First thing that I learned that really shocked me, and I think it, it might shock some of you guys if you did this experiment as well, is that I, move, I removed types. One of the first things I did was remove types, because they made my code harder to read. It was, OK, this is just getting in the way. I'm, I'm writing this all over the place, and it's getting in my way. It's not helping the design of my code, and it's not helping the maintain, maintainability of my code. What's it giving me? So the first surprise to me was that I removed types. I went into this thinking that would never be the case. So I think you can get in a situation where you've written some pretty um, correct but fairly ugly codes. And, and at that point, when it starts to feel uncomfortable, I realize I'll just delete stuff. Um, tests validate what types are not able to prove. So I want types for things that I can prove and tests for things that can happen. And I'll get more into that in a minute. Um, every time I write for all in a property-based test, I should be thinking I, I can refactor that and write a type instead. So anytime you're, you start writing lots and lots of tests to test the same thing, and you're like, wait, this is really every, every single time this needs to happen, you should be encoding that in your type system. It's just easier. It's going to get rid of a, a ton of tests. But the test did help to drive the design of code. Um, I do like do, writing tests first because it helps me to think uh, correctly in order to, to write my code. So it helps the design of my code. However. It's a ton to maintain, right? Every line of test code is still a line of code. So be willing to delete your tests. Every time I can delete a test, it's the same thing as deleting code, and it makes me feel really happy. <laughs> OK, what do you guys think about this code? Hopefully you can see it there. So essentially, we're, we're just writing some tests and validating some stuff. How does the code look? It's fairly clean, right? It's pretty easy to read and understand what's going on. However, what are all these magic numbers? Why is it OK to have magic numbers in tests, but it's not OK to have magic numbers in code? Why is that OK? Who said that's OK? I mean, do you guys put magic numbers in your code, or do you, like the younger developers on your team, you kind of slap their hands when that happens? I know I'm always telling people don't do it. And then in your tests, you do it all the time. So I'm not really sure where those numbers came from. However, the tests are really clean and easy to read. Types save you from having to even think about certain categories of tests. Um, not having to write tests to prove every little aspect of my code, because I can just hack it out in a type, encode it in the type system, and be sure that it's correct, is that, that puts me in my happy place. So something that we learned pretty quickly is that we would just work for weeks. Paul and I would work for weeks on end, writing the same code over and over and over again, testing something just a little bit different, tweaking something here or there. If you never have to deliver, that's awesome. You can have a ton of fun with that. But you know what? When you're on client site or when you're working for your, your customers, you don't really get that ability. So sometimes getting it done is, is more valuable than getting it perfect. 
Um, so it was really kind of nice to not have that deadline in place. Syntax matters. There's no question about it. Uh, we, we're all here at a Scala conference. When I say syntax matters, I mean sometimes Scala is not the sexiest, right? Like this, Travis Brown took a stab at encoding the checksum into the, into the type system, which is awesome. This is very cool. Um, however, it's, it's not very nice code. I don't want to maintain this unless I can justify the return on investment in, in putting this into my, into my repository. Because if I'm doing something like I'm managing bank accounts for real, or if I'm you know, writing code that's going to ensure somebody gets their insulin, or you know, somebody's not going to die, or a, a space shuttle is not going to go down, um, I want to be encoding as much as I possibly can in the type system. And I don't care if it's maintainable. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be willing to take the investment to relearn what I did every single time. If I'm writing a code kata, that's not the case. Like in general, six months from now, I don't want to come back and find this, or I'm not going to really know what's going on. So it's really it's a return on investment type of question. Make sure that you've analyzed, am I doing the best thing for, for my company or for the company that I'm working for? What's the caveat here? What's wrong with encoding this in the type system? Nobody can think of anything. You guys are just. Everybody was out last night drinking and had too much, um, too many side effects today. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, making changes, like we were sort of trying to change almost slightly or the definition slightly or the impact that it would have on the code. So that could be it, but trying to make changes. And we'll, we're going to talk about that in a second as well. But if you don't have all the data coming in at compile time, this won't compile if it's broken. But if you don't have those account numbers at compile time, then you can't say that it won't compile because you don't have the numbers, right? So your test pass, it, it compiles, and then you're still trying to shoot these things through your system. So there are some, when you're dealing with the outside world, there's some things to think about there. That's the hard part. And so if this is the Scala code to encode it into my type system, awesome. This is, uh, this is essentially trying to test the same thing. This is going to give me as much evidence as I need in a code kata to do the exact same thing. And I didn't highlight the code with the colors. And there are magic numbers, but I'd rather read this six months from now. I, I assume mo most of us would. So. I haven't found a language that does a great job of what Jarn Minsky asked. He says, make illegal states unrepresentable. There's not a great language for that yet. I think you know, we're moving in the right direction with things like Iteris, but I've not found a language in all of my, my experimentation. There wasn't a language that made it impossible to, er, to represent an illegal state. Um, types scale a whole heck of a lot better than tests, right? Like writing a couple of lines of code to, to create your type is so much more scalable than having to write hundreds of tests. And generally, when, you, when you're writing your hundreds of tests, if they don't work, you just comment them out, as opposed to fixing them. And so you, you lose some safety there, where if you just write a, t a type, then you're guaranteed the safety. If I'm working with an open source project, and it doesn't have tests, I'm not working with an open source project. I think having the tests in, when you're working with, with other people in an open source fashion, there's just no way that you can do that without tests. I, I wouldn't do it. Uh, I, I think they serve as documentation for the intent, and sometimes they're easier to read than the encoding of the types. Um, I, I kind of agree with Jay Fields on the uh, small, short-lived code bases. You're probably not going to get a lot of value out of the types. Um, I've had a lot of conversations with Garrett Smith, who loves Erlang, and he's like, well, I can see if you have a, a, you know, if you're using the JVM and you have this huge space in memory that you're trying to ensure nothing goes wrong, I can see why you would use a type system there. But in Erlang, I've got this tiny little actor, right? And we could say that in Scala, too. Like, we can have tiny little actors that are doing things, um, but I still think you want the type system to help you there. Um, and so... I think there's some conversations about if you have an actor that is an any to unit, you know, are you really are you doing yourself justice? Um, I think types make it a lot easier to refactor, and I think this is an argument that a lot of testers would say, mm, not so sure. 
types help me to think in a way that I know what's happening where and I can change my code and be really confident that I didn't break something because it won't compile. And I would much rather have code that doesn't compile or takes a long time to compile than putting something into production that's going to embarrass me in front of my client or worse, lose them money. I think types help, to mod help you to modularize your code. They help you to figure out what's going where. Tests can take a long time to run. Types take a long time to compile. Really, there's a trade-off. Do you want to put the time in up front or, or after the fact? But I've heard so many developers say, oh my gosh, Scala takes so long to compile. Why would you ever use that? It's like, how long does it take to run your test suite? Probably longer, typically. You've got a whole lot more tests, more test code a whole lot of times than uh, actual production code. So I really like to refactor to types. I'm not the type of person who thinks of everything in types up front. I write my code and then it's like, oh, I can see where this is going to get obnoxious or there's going to be a problem here. Or, oh, I didn't realize, but that's actually for all. So I will refactor to types. I'll delete a bunch of tests. Uh, and change my code so that I've got it encoded in the type system. So I think refactoring to types is a pattern that, that isn't talked about very often. So, okay, all this said, type systems are not created equal, right? Everybody hates Java, right? Does anybody love Java's type system? When, I, when I'm talking to people who love Clojure and love Ruby, they're like, oh yeah, you, I love type systems, Java, they're great, you have a lot of fun with that. Um, well, I th all type systems are not created equal, and so I'll just give you some of the things that I look for. When I'm, when I'm using a type system, I want to make sure that I've got some abilities um, with the actual type system and then with the language to help me work with those types as well. So the first thing is the sum type. If I don't have a, a nice, easy way to write a sum type, if I have to do a, a, a ton of work to do this, I don't want to have to do that. I'm, I'm probably not going to want to use that language. Um, and after you've used a language that has a great ability to write those, it's, it's hard to go back. It's hard to say, oh, wait, I, I no longer have the ability to easily just hack that thing out. But some types don't really matter unless you have pattern matching. So if you don't have a good pattern matching story, then you could have your, your some types, but it's going to be really hard to work with them anyway. So it's probably only getting you halfway there. So right along the same lines, product types. If it's really hard to create a tuple, I don't want to use your language. I'm sorry. Like, it, it's really not very fun to have to go and, and write 15 lines of code to, to create a class every time. If I could just write a comma instead, right? Like that, that's really quite nice for me. So product types are really important. But if you're using a language that doesn't have currying, then you're o you only have your product types really, you, you can't, if you can't partially apply a function, then you know, there's not a lot of value there either. So I think those things are really important. And I think that a type system needs to be, you, your language needs to be extensible in a way that you have all of the abilities to write your, your new types as the language author did. So the classic example here is like C sharp and F sharp. C Sharp's a, a language that is kind of a few steps up from Java. I'll say that with, and then duck. Um, as far as the type system goes, um, and F Sharp goes well beyond that, more of the OCaml, more into the OCaml space. Um, so when C Sharp got async, everybody was really excited. Async is one instance of a computational expression, or that's F Sharp's word for monad. It's just one implementation, but you don't actually get the ability to write the computational expressions in a very concise, simple way like you do in F-sharp. So there are lots of instances of just that where you, the language designer has really taken away a lot of your flexibility, and you don't even know it. So who knows if Scala is um, nominal or structurally typed? What's the answer? Nominally. nominally typed. So what this means is if you have a type alias, or two type aliases for, um, for a Boolean, type X and type Y, can you, if you have a function that takes an X, can you pass it a Y? A lot of languages, the answer is yes. Some, it's no. Most people don't even know the answer to that question. Um, people who claim to, to love types and, and really want safety, they, they don't know the answer to that question. So I'm questioning how, how much have they really experimented here. 
type inference. This is like, the, this is the evil word, right? If, you, if your language doesn't have type inference, Java, people hate it. If your language does have type inference and you depend on it, you're having, you get less safety. Because it's going to generalize what can be, what can go in and out of your function to the most general as opposed to the most specific. So it can't tell you that it has to be a type um, car as opposed to just type automobile, right? It can't, it can't determine certain things like that for you. So it, it will give you the largest domain as opposed to the smallest. So type inference is a double-edged sword. Depend on it because it's great, especially in Scala, it's quite good. Um, however, the more you depend on it, the less safety you're getting. So it's a trade-off decision. <coughs> is typing those few extra characters worth the safety that you're going to get? Dependent types. So there's an entire session on this later. Um, this is dependent ML. It is making sure that you can't zip two lists together that are of different sizes. Uh, it's kind of one of your classic examples. Um, dependent types allow you to do math within your type system, which is pretty cool. Here's the Idris example, the classic, you're trying to append two vectors together and you make sure that the, the size of your vector A and the size of your vector B, when you, add, when you do the appending, the, the size of your output is the addition of those two sizes. So being able to encode stuff like that in the type system is something that I think we don't have enough experience with at this point to say it's going to change the world, but the amount of things that you can now ensure is pretty phenomenal. And I think this is one of those things that the people who say, I don't get the types of errors that a type system will prevent me from getting, this is one of those things that they just, they probably don't know very much about it. So some final thoughts. Types and tests are two sides of the same coin, right? They're, they're trying to do the same thing. Well, I think it's not really just two sides of the same coin. It's a spectrum. Um, you shouldn't just use types and you shouldn't just use tests. So a lot of people have approached me and said, which side do you fall on? And it's like, well, I don't, I don't have a side. I think each specific project that I'm working on is going to fall somewhere on the spectrum. And I'm going to think about what am, I, what am I doing with this code? What am I intending? Uh, what, do I need to maintain it long term? Is it going to be changing regularly? You know, can I say for all or there exists? Ask yourself all those questions and, and then talk about return on investment for writing the extra code or running less code. So I, I think every project falls on a spectrum. Uh, types are for all and tests is there exists. So there exists a case when I need to test for that. If for every time that then there's a type for that. Stringly type programming is the worst thing ever. Um, if you have a type system, even if you're using Java, you have a type system, right? And you can do things with it. And if you're choosing to make everything a string or an int, you're doing the wrong thing. And <laughs> I don't want to work with you at that point. So stringly type programming is my nemesis. If you have to use the facilities that are available to you. So if I could predict the future, um, and I, I think a lot of people are trying to predict the future, and they're saying things like, future languages should make it so that the code you're writing to, uh, to create your types is the same code that you're writing for, your, for actually writing your functions. Your, your type signatures and your functions should look exactly the same. Haskell, they don't, right? Like it, this is a big problem. People don't want to have to learn this entire second language while they're trying to write their code. So I, I think the closer we can bring those things together, the, the more likely we are going to be to actually use the type system instead of just writing string or, or letting string be inferred. Type inference is awesome, but if you're always inferring string, you're not getting anywhere. So there are some other considerations. Uh, I was talking with Martin Odorsky and he says, well, Amanda, the thing that you're trying to get is the, the language being the same for the type signature and the function. Why don't you just use design by contract? He's like, well, have you ever used the design by con contract constructs that are available within Scala? And I said, no, nobody does. And he says, no, people do. Who <laughs> you do. Is anybody writing um, ensuring? Does anybody even know that exists? A couple of people do. <laughs> yeah, so, so there are constructs that are available to us that we're not using. 
Um, but I think that writing these um, preconditions and postconditions is it's one step along the way. I don't think it goes far enough, and I think that most people generally don't see the value in doing it. Um, questions about simulation testing and mutation testing. So simulation testing, is, there's something called Simulant. The Cognitech guys wrote it for closure. And essentially, you give this system your, your code, and you give it some, some facts about your code, things that you'd like for it to do, and you give it a starting database. It will return to you, after doing all the things that it can possibly do, it will return to you the, the new database. You should be able to write assertions on that new database to make sure that it did the things that you wanted it to do. So I think that's an interesting concept, but the feedback loop is really, really slow, right? Like you have to have written your code and then written these, these property-based tests, basically, and then it's going to allow you to write assertions. But if you're in the process of designing, it can be really hard to think about what those tests are supposed to look like, or you can't actually run them until you're done with the code. So I think that that's not, not exactly the feedback cycle that I, that I want to be working with. Also, mutation testing. I Mutation testing is pretty interesting. If you have a great test suite, and people who, who love tests generally do, or they think they do, until they use mutation testing, which you give the, you give the system your code and a test, and essentially, it'll rewrite your code for you. It'll just randomly break things in your code. And then if your tests don't fail, if you don't have a test for that, you didn't, you didn't prove what you thought you did. So I think that, that's an interesting approach to actually change the code to see, do your tests still pass? And then if they do, that's a bad thing. It's kind of like this anti-intuitive thing. So a type signature is a theorem, and a function definition is a proof. Um, types are for all. Tests is for there exists, or there exists an instance. And use the facilities that are available to you within your code. Don't stringly type program ever, please. <laughs>